everyone. Nice to see you all here. I hated to give up an hour of sleep, <laughs> but we all made it. Um, my name is Diane Meyerholtz. I'm the worship assistant today. And for those of you who are worshiping with us for the first time, welcome. And those of you who are regulars, we're always glad you're here. Um, are there any announcements? Peter? I, have a, I received an update on George Fetter today. He, uh, he's back at Grand Rapids Care Center. He had fluid drains recently. He's feeling better. And this Friday morning at 9 o'clock, you'll have breakfast with him again, if anybody interested in joining. And then, what do I want to come in and join us? 9 o'clock, March 17th, this Friday, at the Grand Rapids Care Center with George. April? Good morning, everybody. I just wanted to remind you that right after service here um, in the sanctuary, we're going to stay seated before we transition over to fellowship. We're going to have a, a brief uh, special meeting uh, to nominate and elect two uh, council members this morning. So we're still looking for two members for the board for a two-year term. So we'll do that right after service in this space. Thank you. Okay, any other announcements? Okay, I invite the children to come down for a children basket. Thank you. 
easier than I thought. <laughs> okay, would you please stand as we offer the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. Holy One, we confess to you our faults and failings. Too often we neglect and do not trust your holy word. We take for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We cause hurt though, though you call us to heal. We choose fear over compassion. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us as we seek to follow in your way of life. Amen. Hear the good news. God so loved the world that God gave the only Son so that all may receive life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy and forgives you in Christ's name and revives you in the Spirit's power. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let us sing our gathering hymn as we gather at your table.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. This holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise let us pray to the Lord help save comfort and defend us gracious Lord pray. God of celebration, you have invited all people to rejoice in the goodness of your love. Help us to be hospitable to all people at your banquet so that all might receive your blessing. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Gospel reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away. One to his farm, another to his business. While the rest, seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Okay, uh, our faith story today is being given by somebody I know and occasionally like, but I do love. <laughs> so here is my husband Dan with our faith with his faith story. Good morning, St. Paul's. Hey, isn't it great? Daylight savings time. Hmm? Yeah. Well, I'm wearing the helmet to remind you that my presentation is a cross between this is your life and GI Blues. Plus, Diane hasn't heard this yet, 
So I may need this for protection a little later. Uh, I'm going to present to you a series of what I call significant emotional events that have occurred in my life that have strengthened my faith in God. As you'll soon see, I'm not an orator. So if daylight savings time starts to take over and your eyes get a little droopy, just go ahead and embrace it. Put your hands in your lap, bend your head down, close your eyes. If I see you, I just think you're praying for me. <laughs> I just hope that when it's over that not everybody's praying for me. Let's start with the first slide. Do you feel lucky, punk? I sure do. My whole life I have felt lucky. Uh, for 43 years of, the, of my life, I had very little to do with what happened to me. So I feel very blessed that I'm where I am today. The question that I have is when does luck turn into more than luck? When does luck become maybe a little bit of divine intervention? So the question I pose is, am I just a cool cat with 39 lives, or has God looked out for me for 73 years? Next slide. Definition of luck, since we're talking about it. Success or failure apparently brought by chance rather than through one's own actions. I want to emphasize through one's own actions because like I say, the first 43 years, most of it was not my doing. Next slide. Let's start at the beginning. I was born in 1949 before there were calendars and the community hospital in Bowling Green. I was number six of seven. I was number two of three that were born in the hospital. We lived in a 1,200 square foot house, three bedrooms, mom and dad in one, three girls in one, four boys in one. None of the rooms were bigger than 10 by 12. So sardines had nothing on us. I can remember when we got our first TV, I was five. We got our first indoor bathroom when I was six. And we got our first phone line when we were seven. And it drove my dad crazy because it was a party line and there were teenage girls on every single line. The phone rang all night long. For those of you who don't understand what a party line is, you didn't have your own phone. You shared it with three or four other families and you had a different ring for each family. So you'd get calls at all hours of the night for especially with teenage girls. Next slide. Fast forward, this is when I was 13 years old. This is my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. There were 72 of us. We didn't use names, just numbers. I'm number 42 up there. All kidding aside, I was very blessed. We had seven kids. We were the first family that graduated all seven kids from high school. And four of us went on to get college degrees. As you can see here, my family favorite passage was Genesis 128. Anybody? There it is. Be fruitful and multiply. And they multiplied. When my grandparents died, there were 102. Fast forward. There I am. That's me in junior, uh, a junior in high school. I just turned 16. I was walking through the hall when a counselor stopped me, Gary Evans. He said, Dan, I scored a job for you downtown. You start today. It's on Main Street, right across the street from the Claysell Drive-In. Uh, I think he chose me because he dated my sister in high school. The job was for a janitor at the local radio station, WMGS, the country king. I got paid a dollar an hour. Minimum wage at that time was 75 cents. And I was, uh, had a bunch of friends that were earning 50 cents flipping hamburgers at the Burger Chef. That was before even McDonald's. 
Because of a parking problem they had, I had to drive home one of the cars each night. It was a 1965 Dodge station wagon, had WMGS emblazoned on all the doors, and it had a pair of bullhorns mounted on the hood. Now you would think with a radio station, they would be bullhorns that played music. They were real bullhorns, had about a five foot span standing right out there on the front of the hood. You can imagine the number of uh, strange looks that I got as I drive home. <clears throat> well, a year into the job, the GDA that did the night show quit and walked out. So with about 20 minutes of instruction, the Dan deal was born. Next slide. Next slide. I'm 17 and I have my own country and western show and the best part about it was my salary jumped to $2.25 an hour which was unheard of. I was almost making as much as my dad. Um, I was a terrible DJ but uh, I did have a following. I got fan mail. Most of it was from little old ladies. Uh, my slogan was, you're digging the doings of the Dan deal. <laughs> you can only imagine the ribbing that I took from my high school friends. They're listening to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and I'm playing Kitty Wells, Hank Snow, and Merle Haggard. Well, I just smiled because I was making three times as much as any of them. Next slide. The show lasted almost three years. I made enough money to pay my way through college. So was I lucky or was I blessed? Next slide. Graduation. And for this part, I enlist my wife. Well, Dan and I both went to St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Bowling Green and we were having a Luther League party. That's what they called when all the kids got together, normally on a Sunday night. Well, this particular Luther League party, it was for Dan's class who was graduating, and it was in the summer. And we had the party over at a friend's house out on Mercer Road. Well, I'm in the kitchen, and I'm doing the dishes with my friend, and I had never met Dan. I had never seen Dan. And he walked by the window, and I swear to God, I looked at my friend, and I said, that's the guy I'm going to marry. So almost 52 years later, divine intervention, in my opinion, struck me when I saw him. Did she lay a trap for me or what? <laughs> yep. Upon graduation from high school, I got a four-year college deferment from the military. I thought, surely Vietnam cannot be going on four years later. Next slide. That summer, the radio station sponsored a live show at Toledo Sports Arena. The headliner was Buck Owens, and the warm-up act was Shub Woolley. I'm sure most of you don't know who any of them are, but it was a pretty big show. I was there in my blue blazer, WMGS emblazoned, emblazoned on the patch, on my coat pocket, had my black cowboy hat, had my roach-killing cowboy boots on. Well, the MC that was supposed to do the show didn't show up, so they grabbed me. 17 years old, dragged me out on stage in front of 5,000 people, and I introduced Sheb Woolley. Well, he grabs me and says, I want you to sing a duet with me. And I told you I was going to tell you about my singing career. Well, this was unrehearsed. He sang the lead in, he pointed at me to sing the chorus. I sang, next slide. I was a one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people leader. One-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people leader. One-eyed, 
horn flying purple people leader. What a sight to see. Well, I had to sing that chorus twice. Diane was sitting in the audience so proud of me. <laughs> but my singing career ended that night. Later that fall, despite my defunct singing career, Diane and I decided to take our relationship, next slide, to another level. We went to the Passion Pit, the Portage Drive-In. Diane will fill you in. Well, um, I can honestly say I don't remember the movie. Um, However, um, the fog had started to roll in, and we thought we were steaming up the windows, but it was the actual fog. We couldn't see the screen, so Dan said, let's just leave and go home. And we said, okay. So we started home, and we're going down Euler Road because we thought, well, okay, we could resume our kissing part. So we go out Euler Road, and as we're going along, Dan said, you know something? I think there's a railroad track right here. And the minute he said that, a train went right by us, and it missed us by not more than two feet. Was divine intervention involved? Oh, yeah. I went home that night, and I thank God so much. He probably got tired of hearing me, but yeah, that was a very close call, but that was God on my side and on Dan's side as well. Well, again, I ask you, were we lucky or were we blessed? Next slide. There we go. Doesn't that look like a steely-eyed warrior, huh? Fast forward to graduation from college. Vietnam was still going on. So I managed to wrangle a, a six-month delay in entry so I could go to an officer candidate school class. I completed basic training and went to Fort Sill, home of the artillery, six, for six months. Now this one's really going to get tired. Next slide. There we are at graduation. I got my butter bar. That's the bar you put on your shoulder. I made it to the officer. Uh, no one from my class went to Vietnam. So was I lucky or what? I evaded that war completely. So I felt very good about that. Our first assignment was at Fort Carson, Colorado, the Mountain Post. Well, shortly after we got there, I was told we had to end up going to St. Barbara Day per, uh, celebration. And I'm going to St. Barbara Day. They said, yeah, St. Barbara, uh, she's the patron saint of the field artillery. Well, St. Barbara was a 4th century Christian whose father was a pagan worshiping Greek king. She refused to give up her religion, so in one day, in a fit of rage, he drew his sword and struck her dead. And immediately, he was struck by a lightning bolt from heaven and killed him. So, St. Barbara is the patron saint of sudden death. Can you imagine? I'm going to be worshiping sudden death. Well, anyway, St. Barbara was canonized, the patron saint of sudden death. She protects artillerymen, miners, and people who were struck by lightning. Next slide. There we are going to St. Barbara. Next slide. This is a M109 self-propelled howitzer. I was assigned to a battery of uh, this cannon. Uh, it could shoot a 100-pound projectile about 25 miles. So in order to hit a target, obviously, you had to have somebody out there looking for it and then adjusting the rounds in. It's called a four observer, and that was my first job. Next slide. My first time downrange, I was assigned to an infantry company, and the company commander's name was Captain Weird. I called him Captain Weird. 
Uh, he wanted me to ride in the back of his Jeep so that he could get artillery fire whenever he wanted it. Well, one day he and his driver took off, running along at about 35, 40 miles an hour through open country, didn't use any of the roads, don't ask me why he was doing it. But in Colorado, water has a very eroding effect and it creates cuts in the soil. Some of them can be 12, 14 feet across. Well, the driver managed to find one of those and we went airborne. That's not me, actually, that's just a representation, but we were actually off the ground. I was riding in the back. Well, when the Jeep came down, the front end of it slammed into the bank on the other side and I got catapulted over the windshield. Well, I escaped serious injury by, next slide, a field of wild sunflowers, and that's how they grow there. It was like a giant yellow mattress that uh, broke my fall. I was uninjured, lost my glasses, had to wander around for three more days, uh, not being able to see anything. Next slide. Second time out, you can see what erosion does out there. That's called a, a, an escarpment. And uh, we were riding along the top of it and had to come down to the bottom. It was about a 400 foot drop, gravel road. I'm in my Jeep, I've got my driver with me and we start down the embankment. And all of a sudden he loses control and the Jeep slides sideways. And we start going down the hill, Jeep on this, I turn around to look to tell him to steer back in, and I don't have a driver. He jumped out of the Jeep. So I'm sliding down the hill sideways, got to the bottom, Jeep rolls over, I fall down into a little depression, probably was an old foxhole at one time. Jeep comes up in the air, slams down on top, the windshield lands close to my arm, the gear shift hits me in the chest, and my feet are up under the dashboard. Here comes the best part. When they lift the Jeep off of me, the first thing I saw was a doctor and a gurney. We rolled over in front of a field hospital that was located at the bottom of the escarpment. Now, was that luck or was I being blessed? Well, my third time out, you're, this was a bad tour, I tell you. My third time out was with an armor unit, and we had dismounted, going to charge up this hill, take it. It was just about getting to be nighttime. It was a hot, humid day, and all of a sudden, I see this cloud, and it's coming toward me, and I'm out there standing in, in the, uh, next to a tank with a whip antenna radio on my back and a, and a microphone in my hand, and I'm talking to my headquarters. All of a sudden, bright flash of light, and I black out. Next slide. Struck by lightning. So I woke up, I saw nothing but dazzle. Uh, it was like the electricity came down the antenna, through the thing, the radio, out the mic, and it punched me right in the, in the mouth. My lips swelled up huge, and she says, She's laughing at me when I come home. And uh, she says, well, the big lips makes your nose look smaller. <laughs> well, my last escapade with a Jeep, next slide. My driver managed to drive me one day into a swamp and my Jeep sunk. They gave this to me as a going away uh, caricature of, of my adventures with Jeeps. Next slide. Time to get serious now. Uh, my last field assignment was with the Pershing II missiles in Germany. They were being put in uh, new, it was a nuclear warhead on the, on the tip of it, and we were being inspected by the the military gets inspected by a civilian organization that uses nuclear weapons. Anyway, my job was to supervise the assembly of the missiles at the new location. We had driven for, uh, to get there about 75 miles and it was nine below zero. 
So when we got there, I said, I've got to have a hot cup of coffee. So I pulled over at the headquarters, got the coffee when the radio came on, and it said the missile had blown up and it uh, killed three and, and injured 14. And had it not been for me wanting a cup of coffee, I would have been there. So again, luck or divine intervention. So we finish that. Next slide. That's where the accident took place. It was right on the other side of those buildings. It was a place called Heilbronn. It was in the news, newspapers back here. Well, anyway, shortly after we finished up that assignment, we were on our way home. Uh, we were rotating back to the States. We were flying out on Pan Am. We had a dog. And we were going to put the dog on the, on the plane with us, so we had to board the plane last. Um, we check the dog in. We go and we get on the plane. We land in Atlanta, and there's all kinds of cameras and pictures taken, and they're all talking, asking us how we're doing, and we're going, well, there must be somebody, you know, famous on the airplane. Well, as it was, it turned out we were the last people to leave the airport before they blew it up. A terrorist organization. Next slide. Where that little cut is, that's where we put the dog. They said that the bomb was there when we were checked through. So we were the last ones that made it on before the bomb went off. Okay, next slide. This is another kind of light order one. This is my last tour that I had. And it was um, planning exercises with foreign countries, particularly one of them was Philippines. Well, at that time, uh, the Philippines was very unstable, and they had terrorist groups that were shooting Americans as they came off the plane at the Manila airport. So the government decides, we're going to go ahead and charter an airplane to carry all the military to the Philippines. Okay. It flew from San Francisco to Honolulu, where I was stationed, then on to Guam, and from Guam on to the Philippines. Well, I get on the plane, and as it would be, the cheapest bid got the, got the call, Hawaiian Airlines. Now, if you don't know Hawaiian Airlines, they fly about 98% of their flights from one island to the other, which could be maybe 25, 30 miles, 15, 20-minute flights. Now they're going to fly across the entire Pacific, which... They go and get some old L-1011s, that's what that aircraft is, uh, to do the job. Well, the first time they fly in, they land in Honolulu. I get on the plane. First thing I notice is I'm walking down the aisle. The aisle flooring is moving with me because the rivets had all come out of the aluminum plating. Uh, we get on the airplane. plane takes off. A couple hours into it, they come on and say, well, the number three engine has failed. So we're going to have to land to have, have a look at it. And I'm going, now wait a minute. We're in the middle of the Pacific. There aren't just a whole lot of places out here we could put this plane down. Well, luckily we were near Guam, or not Guam, but Wake Island. Wake Island's about maybe three or four miles long, and it's a continuous sea. So when we land the plane in the dark, We've got one wing over water, we got one wing over water, and he's turning constantly to the left uh, to land the airplane. Well, we were there about four or five hours. We take off again, comes on the radio and says, number three engines failed again, so we're going to skip going to Guam, we're going straight to the Philippines. And I'm going, well, there's an airport, airplane right, or airport right behind us. What are we doing here? So we flew in, I get off the airplane, I'm going, boy, I'm glad that's over with. Well, a week later, when I want to go home, I have to get back on the same airplane. We take off, and as we're going, the third engine failed again, and it was like a Sky King movie with the wheels down and the trees coming, and the wheels touch on top of the trees. And the guy comes online and he says, well, 
Number three is you failed, so we're going to fly on to Guam. And I'm going again. Wait a minute, there's an airport right behind us. What are you doing? So we fly on to Guam, we get there, and just as he's starting to land, he pulls the nose up, another engine fails, the nose drops down, we came into the runway nose first and slid to a halt, bent the land gear. And then the pilot has the audacity to say, uh, you need to make sure that you take everything off the airplane because I don't think we're gonna be able to take off again. Well, I spent, all expenses paid four-day holiday in Guam uh, based on uh, Hawaiian Airlines. The last story I have to finish this up, um, I went on to a job in, in Florida uh, with the Florida National Guard. I went to Tallahassee often to deal with the government there, and I stayed in a hotel called the Cabot Lodge. Uh, they had happy hour in being a good artilleryman, I took advantage of happy hour. Uh, the, head, the, the head building was up in front, the, the rest of it was separated and there was a pool in there. And I had already had a couple, decided it's time to go, we, we were gonna walk up to a restaurant there. We come out the back door and I look over and there's nobody in the pool except this little boy and he's going down for the last time in the deep end. So, fully clothed, shoes on, I jump in, take the kid up off the bottom of the pool and revive him on the side of the pool. What had happened was that the hotel had failed to put the rope back up after they cleaned the pool, and so he simply just walked off into the deep end. Well, I often wonder if God took care of me so I could be there to save that kid. So that pretty much ends my story. But the best thing about my luck in life is this moment. Last slide. And here's the blessed boy wondering about luck. Thank you. I, I just hope for you all that if you have a young child that they're as lucky as I've been.
profess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. And together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. We pray for your church, bless partnerships with other Christians in interreligious dialogue, guide the daily work of denominational and congregational leaders, strengthen our combined witness for the sake of the gospel that all experience your life-giving love. Merciful God, we pray for the universe. All creation teems with life from the depths of the earth and seas to the skies above. Fill us with awe and reverence for the diversity and preservation of life. Merciful God, we pray for the nations of the world. Topple the dividing walls that separate us from our neighbors. Form us into your beloved community where diversity of gender, race, language, ability, and ethnic origin is celebrated and affirmed. Merciful God. We pray for those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. Be present with all who are lonely and give courage to all who are afraid. Comfort those who live with chronic illness or other sickness. Give them your living water always. Merciful God. We pray for this congregation, especially those preparing for baptism. Nurture their faith and pour your love into their hearts. Inspire our community by their testimony to God's grace in their lives. Merciful God, we give thanks for the lives of all your saints, especially Gregory the Great, whom we commemorate today. Their hope in you sustained lives of faith and service. Encourage us with the hope they shared in you. Merciful God, we lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. We will now have the offering.
God of good gifts, receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. Gathered now into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. And together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. We will now sing, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. As Christ sends us into the world, let us remember who we are. We are St. Paul Lutheran Church, called by Christ and freed by the grace of God. What is the mission Christ sends us to do? Our mission is to build community. How? By compassionately reaching out to all through worship and witness. And why? To renew the spirit. Go in peace, serve in love. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thanks for sitting right back down. <laughs> All right, so we'll go ahead and start our uh, special meeting.